to investigate the men behind the magazine, viz. It's given a benchmark by which we can register where society is today. The standards have gone down terrifically lately and uh, that's not doing anything to improve it, is it? If you live in 1989, then it's okay. If you live in 1689, and it's kind of rough. I would advise them not to buy it. I'll plead with them not to read it. Those people you have just seen were talking about this comic, Viz. Ten years ago, it sold 150 copies. Last year, each issue sold over 100,000. This year, it looks set to top one million. It's been called the publishing success story of the decade, but many people believe that behind this success story lies a sinister tale of deception and intrigue by four men so obsessed with their own obscene humor that they represent a serious threat to the very core of our society's values. In the next hour, we will examine the evidence to see if Viz is simply harmless schoolboy fun or serious cause for concern. Take this man. He was once a popular television celebrity. His name is Keith Chegwin. But his life fell apart when Viz published this article about him. How did you feel when they published that article? Well, absolutely blew me furious, to be honest with you. I mean. You know, you can't just go around writing articles like that. I mean, like, you know, the Sun newspaper has put me in a better light over the years. Um, like, I mean, the phone stopped ringing. I haven't done any telly. Um, I'm just absolutely furious. I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, I don't think people have got the right to go around saying such damaging articles. And they don't realise what they're doing. How was your career before Viz uh, wrote this article? Well, I mean... I had uh, Saturday Superstore on, I was doing Checkers Plays Pop, I did a series called Checkman Checks Out Consumer Programme, I was gigging sort of five, six nights a week, I was doing radio work, I was offered pantos, uh, even been offered a part in a film yeah. at the same time, and mm -hmm. that all just went out the window. Since this article was published, money has been hard to come by for Keith, and he has to scrape a living in whatever way he can. The way, the way that I do earn money is obviously, you know, pottering outside along the shore or the beach or something, you know, pick up the odd can or, you know, you can find some, some good things down there. You know, uh, I found a two, two, uh, tennis ball and a rubber ball today. And uh, the kids down the road always give us 20p for them, you know. So at least that's me bus fare into town. Mm. Sorry if I get so choked. Are you signing on at the moment? Yeah. What's it like when you go down the Dole office? Well, uh, very embarrassing. You know, you have to stand in queues for hours on end. Uh, people say, oh, here it comes. You know, Checker's coming to get his pop. But television celebrities like Keith are not the only people to be abused by Viz. It has also turned its poison pen on her own royal family, with a tirade of scurrilous and outrageous articles in what many see as a serious attempt to undermine the monarchy. Mrs. Stella Shacklady from Bristol came across one such article and felt so strongly about it that she wrote to the palace. She received this reply. Thank you for your recent letter and for sending us the article which caused you offence. I have to say that this is not the first time that this particular publication has been brought to our attention. I must explain, however, that in our experience, any public protest or action taken against such articles only serves to give them wider publicity. I feel that if such a, a thing was written about me or any of my family, we would be entitled to take the right to the court for slander or defamation of character. The Queen is not in a position to do this, and I think that such articles should be stopped. The article suggested that the Queen was losing her marbles, as the magazine put it, 
and that she was doing extraordinary things. She was going around the palace muttering to herself and letting her, her person go and, and being generally acting like a crazy person, which I'm sure everyone who's a subject of the Queen knows to be quite wrong. I like people to laugh with me, but not at me. And I'm sure Her Majesty feels the same. And I think it's a very cruel and scurrilous piece of writing. The marketing of Viz as a comic has provided it with a front, behind which it can publish these scandalous articles. But a further inspection reveals its characters to be a far cry from traditional Dandy and Beano favourites. These obscene drawings are the staple fare of an average issue of Viz and have led to its rejection in the past by responsible publishers like John Sanders. Viz is the nearest thing to outright disgustingness that anybody could possibly read. In Viz, as I recall the characters, there is one character whose only attribute is that he can pass wind through his anus uh, at fairly regular intervals. There's another character whom I believe is still there, whose only attribute is that he is extremely offensive to women. There's another character, as I recall, whose only characteristic is the size of his testicles. And I think that when you put all these things together, you've got something which surely, even uh, in an age where uh, instincts have become subtly corrupted, is not acceptable. I'm not against some soft porn. This is a personal view. Uh, but I think that uh, Viz is is lavatorial at best and disgusting at worst. There is little doubt that the lavatorial humour in Viz distorts our perceptions. Dr Ludmilla Rickwood is an expert in the psychology of humour and arousal. According to our research data, that if a material here is highly arousing uh, using shock tactics, etc., or highly arousing sexually, it could in fact increase the prevalent emotions in any individual who has them, such as hostility. It could increase them, not decrease them. And this is my uh, argument against pornography in general. This journal deals not only with sexual behavior, but also with unprovoked violence. And I would say that that would facilitate uh, people who are reading it and who are inclined that way in that direction, which is obviously detrimental to society, such as violence, sexual violence, or just uh, ordinary armed violence <laughs> with uh, people around them, unprovoked as well. Viz is drawn and written at a secret address in Newcastle-upon-Tyne by four men. Christopher Donald is the editor, believed to be the godfather of the entire Viz network. His brother, Simon Donald, widely believed to be the coordinator of Viz's clandestine activities. Ex-botanist Graham Dury, major contributor and responsible for Christopher Donald's personal safety. Simon Thorpe, the marker. He has been described as possibly the most dangerous element in the Viz organization. With each copy of Viz costing 90 pence, the organization is forced to launder an estimated 900,000 pounds per issue. On that basis, they would gross a staggering 5.4 million pounds per annum, without even considering the huge profits they must generate from merchandising. But all this success has not been without its casualties, and there is one man who claims that Viz stole and distorted his original vision. He came to see us, a broken man. For reasons of personal safety, he wishes to remain anonymous. We shall call him Stephen. This is an idea, an idea that I had years ago, years, for, for my own reasons. I confided in Christopher and Simon thought they could help me to bounce ideas around and work out the best way to exploit them. And they were very helpful. I was, I was dependent on, on their opinions. So I told them 
I told them every idea that I had. How, how would you say it's affected your life? Well, look at me now. I mean, just look at what, what I've got. Nothing. It's not just the money, though, is it? No, no, it's, it's the perversion, the perversion, the, the filth. I mean, Johnny Short Pants was just a, a light-hearted, amusing little romp about a, a schoolboy who still wears short trousers at the age of 12. I mean, there was no smutty innuendo or anything like that in Viz. It's, it's, the, it's not the same comic anymore. I mean, if I'd done it, it would have been wholesome family entertainment, something you could show your mother. I don't think that, well, I don't think anybody's mother would be interested in reading Viz. Stephen has waged a personal campaign to have Viz withdrawn from the shelves, a task which has proven fraught with danger. Most unhelpful have been comments by literary critics in the mold of Oberon War. I think if the uh, future generations look back on the literature of the age, uh, they'll uh, be more usefully look back to Viz than they would, for instance, the novels of Peter Aykroyd or Julian Barnes or any of the people you're likely to meet at literary gatherings nowadays. Simply because the, the, the Viz has got a genuine vitality and a vitality of its own, a vitality which comes up from the uh, society which it represents. And these novelists don't. Wherever you look at uh, sort of lavatory jokes, you automatically think of Rabelais and Gargantua. I don't know if you remember the passage where uh, there's this giant figure uh, who decides that the easiest and best way to wipe his bottom is with a goose. Uh, um, and th then one looks at Viz and one sees this machine, which is, I suppose, the mo a modern equivalent of a sort of bicycle for the same purpose. Uh, but of course, th there aren't all that number of new jokes to be made, and uh, you'd expect the same jokes to come out. That's a sort of mechanized version, I suppose, of the Rabelaisian goose joke. Uh, and uh, so long, then you, when you get to things like the bottom inspectors, which is one of my favorite of all the re uh, regular features, not always regular, but anyway, um, that seems to me to be entirely inspired by George Orwell. But of course, they're dealing with the same thing. Uh, here are these lads, if that's what they are in Liverpool and Newcastle, are worried about the restrictions, petty and oppressive restrictions, everyday life, and dream up the bottom inspectors. But exactly the same idea that Orwell was playing with in his critique of uh, Stalinist Russia. Except in their case, it's obscene. But that doesn't seem to have stopped alternative comedian Harry Enfield, who is one of a handful of public figures converted to the Viz doctrine. Here, he actually appears in Viz, in one of their bawdy photo narratives. He remains an unapologetic fan. All my showbiz pals read Viz. In fact, we all read it together in our luxury saunas, because I often have people around. In fact, that, that was the way, because um, I'm great friends with most people in showbiz, like um, all the young ones and all the alternative comedians. We often have parties and jacuzzis together in our posh houses. And, uh, likes at of orgies and stuff. And uh, in fact, there was one particular occasion when uh, my great friends, uh, A. Edmondson and Jennifer Saunders, who he's married to, like they were around and uh, Jenny was having a baby, right, a second baby, and it wouldn't come out. So I, I rang up Ken Dodd, my pal, and he came around with his tickle stick and like tickled her tummy and it still wouldn't come out. And in the end, I had to give her a copy of Viz and it was so funny the baby popped out. In fact, it was so funny that she had five babies by the end of the night. Well, more valuable than Harry's views on Viz was my first major break. I managed to extract from Harry the telephone number of the Viz office. Hello? Hello? Is that the Viz offices? I wish to speak to Christopher Donald, please. No, or Simon Thorpe, or Graham Dury, please. No, there's nobody of that name here. What number are you trying to get? Uh, that is the... The number I've just dialed is the Viz offices, so... Uh, I'm afraid there's not anybody of that name here. Could you please put me through to Christopher Donald, please? No, I'm afraid there's nobody Thank of you. that name here. Well, obviously, uh, they must have had a tip-off. Could I speak to Mr Graham Dury, please? Graham Dury isn't here. 
I know this to be the Viz office. It, it's no use covering up. Would you mind pu putting me through to Christopher, Simon, Graham, or the other Simon, please? Uh, um, please, no, could I you put me through? No, I think you're mistaken. You're just mistaken. You must have a wrong number. My only option was to go direct to the publisher, John Brown. The London Connection. I asked him what on earth possessed him to publish Viz. It was funny and cheap to produce. Do you think Viz is perhaps obscene? No. Fruity. What would you say to the people who say it is obscene? It isn't. Or in my opinion, it isn't. What do you think about the uh, bad language that's used in Viz? I think it's pretty, I think it's usually very funny. What would you say to uh, people who say it's upsetting? That we're sorry. That they're upset. And be as nice to them as possible. Some people would say that the royal exclusives are outrageous. How would you answer that? Who says that? Mrs. Shacklady. Oh, yes, Mrs. Shacklady. Um, I'd say well, we, 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 uh, that we're sorry again and that uh, we feel that they're not offensive and that uh, they shouldn't be taken as being offensive and that the, our readers won't take them as offensive in the main. How would you defend the exclusive article that you ran which read, has Fergie got a fat ass or what? Well, I'd defend it very easily because it's satirizing. Uh, it, it, is, it is in fact making fun of um, the gutter press. How do you think Fergie felt when she read the article? I, tr I never thought about it. Could I go to the Viz offices and perhaps have an interview with the Viz people? Not at the moment, no. Olga Monty Python comedian Michael Palin is purported to be a fan of Viz comic. Hello, Michael. Hello, Michael Palin here. Hello, Philip Branston here. Hello, Philip. Some people claim that Viz is obscene. What do you think? Well, parts of it are, yes. I think that's part of its appeal, really. I would say obscene is sort of something I wouldn't know quite how to define. What's obscene for one person isn't obscene for another. I certainly quite find a lot of it, uh, the risks it takes, rather worth taking. Did you have to uh, field similar criticisms in the early days of Monty Python? Well, I think it's a good, it's a good sign uh, of, of producing any sort of new humour that, that uh, a certain number of people are totally and completely outraged just because it's new. And I think there tend to be people either without a sense of humour or who have uh, deep personal problems in their own lives and uh, get, get rather worried and concerned about people making light of these things. Uh, and, and we just went ahead with it, really, did what made us laugh, and I, I suspect that's what, how Viz works. Uh, as, as I gather, it's a fairly small group of people putting the thing together, and they're probably doing what makes them laugh, rather the same way as we did in Python. I mean, it, I, I see in, in, in Viz a lot of the spirit of early Python. But don't you think it causes a lot of harm? Um, well, I, I think harm to probably a lot of uh, old, rather dyed-in-the-wool attitudes, yes. Um, and, and I think that's probably beneficial. Uh, I think that, that, as far as I'm concerned, it makes me laugh rather a lot. And I think most people who read it, it makes them laugh a lot. And I don't think laughter can generally cause harm, unless it's sort of malicious and jeering, and unless it's sort of uh, provoked by, by sort of crudeness or crassness. And I think there's always an edge with, with the best of his. An edge, though, that most people think has scarred our country's basic moral values. Indeed, Michael Palin and his Monty Python colleagues could be held responsible for unlocking the comic floodgates that were eventually to become unhinged. In 1979, here in Newcastle, Chris Donald published the first issue of Viz, not knowing that he was planting a seed that would turn into an acorn that would grow into a mighty oak that we know today as Viz Comic. Christopher Donald now controls the multi-million pound Viz empire, which he built from nothing. But back in 1979, the young ex-DHSS clerk pulled no punches in gaining a stranglehold on Newcastle. His first stop was the card bar, where he threatened to discredit the store unless they sold the comic. Frightened proprietor Brian Sandals, for obvious reasons, tells a different story publicly. Well, Chris came into the shop with a, a copy of the comic and asked me if I would be interested in selling it. And uh, I get quite a few people in, youngsters, bringing in 
their idea of a, a most wonderful comic in the world. And I'm not terribly impressed normally, but when I glanced through the first, well, the, the second issue of Viz, uh, I, I recognised what I thought was a talent, and uh, I, I suggested one or two various things that he could do with it, and uh, I said, yes, I would most certainly try, uh, try it in the shop and see if I could sell it. So he, uh, he produced, the, I think, issue number three, and that was the first one that we put into the shop to sell. How do you feel it uh, fits in with the rest of this old tat that you sell? Well, it's old tat to the older generation, shall we say, but it's the kind of thing that the teenagers want, that's why I, that's why I stuck it. Uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that I would wear or that, uh, that I would um, expect to, to uh, go into a shop and buy. It's certainly not my age group that, would, uh, that it would appeal to, but certainly the age group that my stock appeals to, Viz hits, uh, hits them right between the eyes. It certainly does. This is Roger Melly, one of Christopher Donald's most prominent Viz characters. Based on a popular television presenter, the character's vocabulary consists largely of a stream of expletives. But not content with his own excesses, Christopher Donald was soon to enlist his brother Simon. Simon Donald was the wild one. Often in trouble with the police and his teachers, his academic qualifications left a lot to be desired. His contributions to Viz were to drag it yet deeper into the mire. After distorting Stephen's Johnny short pants and creating Johnny fart pants, there was absolutely no stopping him. But quite where he got his inspiration remained shrouded in mystery. I set off to investigate. The Donald brothers were educated here. Heaton School, this magnificent red brick school in the heart of Newcastle. Simon Donald's school reports uncovered here for the first time reveal that at first he was an exemplary pupil. This report was written in January 1977. Simon is a sensible, cooperative pupil. He does his best to set a good example to his classmates. Well done, Simon. But by July of the very same year, his reports revealed a sudden and ominous deterioration. A remarkable change for the worse in Simon's attitude and performance since the beginning of the year. He seems to lack incentive in most subjects, is wasting time and has been in trouble for silly behaviour, including spitting and questioning a teacher's authority. Simon must make a serious effort to regain his former status next year. This was not to happen. His teacher, Mr Toshak, remembers him only too well. He wasn't brilliant, no, he wasn't brilliant at all. He could have been, but he wasn't. He could have worked harder, but didn't. <laughs> I think he could have used his talents in a more, more constructive way. Uh, you know, he has a, a great talent there, uh, and I think to go into uh, semi-corruption <laughs> uh, is a, well, one of those things that he has found himself, but he's been successful at, but I think he could have directed it more, more successfully. Strange as a biologist, we try to get the the correct terminology over to the, the pupils in, the, in our school and, and in society. And of course, when you read of his comic and you get the, uh, the old rude words appearing in for all the rude parts, uh, yes, that's got to be. Uh, you know, you're getting the rude words back into the society again when we have, I think, successfully uh, got these words out of the language in our school. Vulgarity was to become Simon Donald's calling card. This character's sole delight is the verbal and physical abuse of the opposite sex in a wholly intolerable manner. The only place such detailed research could have taken place was in his bedroom, which I believe must be the Viz office. I found his home address in an old school file. Number 16, I'm going to ring the doorbell see if there's anybody here. Hello, Mr. Donald. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Philip Branston. I'm investigating Viz Comics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, is uh, Chris or Simon here? No, I don't live here anymore. No, we moved up a while ago. I can help you. What do you, what do you do? do you think I could have the address of the current Viz office? 
Oh, I, I can't disclose that. Do you think there's any chance of looking at the old offices? Certainly. Can we come here? Thanks very much. Come on, let's see where this. At last, I was to enter the lion's den. Yeah, well, you, you walked in here, and it was difficult to walk in because there was that much stuff around, particularly waste paper yeah. and scrap paper bins. Um, the desk would be desk over here, would it? What? And so, so Simon or Chris would sit through here, would it? Yeah, he? that's right. And there was another big drawing board over there. They seemed to have two or three large drawing boards, because drawing and cartooning is a very important part of the comic, as you know. Yes, of course it is. Was Chris spotting trains at the same time as drawing here? I think a lot of lads in the North East grew up loving railways because this is the sort of home of railways. And so if we move along here, we come to the part where perhaps Simon sat, was it? That's right, yes, yes. Uh, and I suppose that's another bit of the old railway line there, is it? That's it, yeah, it goes right along the full length. Mr Donald was soon to drop this friendly demeanour when I asked him when and where his sons carried out their deviant sexual research. And I wonder that too, because it was all work here. They didn't seem to have much time for relaxation. I think it went out late in the evening, but uh, this was a hive of industry. Yes, not a setting for a Roman or Greek in orgy. He also reluctantly admitted, when pushed, that Stephen originated the comic. Yeah, um, I think he had sort of ideas uh, about the comic originally. Um, but Chris developed it, Chris took it on. The Viz staffing situation was not to remain stable for very long. They were soon joined by a botanist from Leicester, the gonad factor. Graham Dury brought with him the most obscene portfolio of characters Christopher Donald had ever seen. They were so funny I crapped myself, he is reported to have said. As a scientist who specialised in genetic mutations, he developed this character, a grotesquely deformed mutant with severely enlarged glands. Much to my surprise, Graham Dury's colleagues in the botany department at Leicester University actually mourn his departure from the faculty. It's uh, a great loss to our, our lab and I think science in general. And he would have had probably a very, very good career as a scientist, as a professional scientist. As Graham got deeper and deeper into the Viz organisation, did this affect his research at all? Yes, it certainly did. Uh, the effect was quite gradual at first, but then there were more obvious signs which I found in the department. And I have one here, just an, as an example. Uh, one of our projects, which was funded by a well-known high street supermarket chain, was to develop a range of uh, attractive uh, cacti. And I think it's fairly obvious to anybody why this particular one was rejected. But even more devastated by Graham Dury's decision to leave science were his parents. Yesterday he went up to university when he got his degree. I mean, he wasn't any proud appearance there, was he no. really? No, no very, he was to death hard. for him. He'd worked hard for it. Were you a bit disappointed when Graham gave up botany? We perhaps thought, you know, there was four or five, six years being wasted. I mean, they can't, touch the, they can't take the degree off him, can they? He's still got that. His parents have also been deeply upset by characters like the fat slags, Graham Dury's most offensive offering to date. It marks a distressing change in his attitude to women. His longtime girlfriend, Karen, has been so devastated by these changes that she reluctantly agreed to talk with us. When I first met him, we used to go on long country walks and we used to run through fields picking flowers and he was very romantic. He used to buy chocolates and flowers and not anymore. Did he pay you a lot of attention? Oh, he used to pay me attention all of the time. I, I used to see him all day, every day, if I could. So you would say that you had a happy relationship? Oh, I'm very happy, very happy. How far has it changed now? He never pays me any attention. I never see him. I'm just a Viz widow. Do you feel that Viz is rather like a drug to Graham? I do. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a drug. I say it as a drug. The next person to be initiated into the Viz organisation was Simon Thorpe, a quiet lad from Pontefract, but master of the double entendre. Beneath Simon Thorpe's quiet exterior lies an obsessive man, and one who few would dare to cross. He has never been known to miss an innuendo. 
Everyone in Viz contributes characters, but Simon Thorpe has a big one, Finbar Saunders, a sick and demented character who takes the double meaning to its ultimate sticky end. This is Simon Thorpe 20 years ago. No one could have imagined that he would grow up to be a serious threat to society. His now estranged sister Julie remembers those days fondly. He was a really, really nice boy, you know, he was um, quiet and um, kind and, um, well, it's just terrible. It's a real shock to the whole family and what's happened to him since. When did you first notice Simon taking an interest in obscene material? Um, it was when he was about 15, he was doing his um, art exams at school. He used to bring home, you know, you know, books full of sketches of um, nude women and uh, male and female anatomy, really. We, we got quite worried about it then. Are there any of Simon's characters that you find particularly offensive? Um, Norbert Colon, I think, is the worst. It's just dreadful. Really. Why is that? Well, it's, it's really offensive to um, old people, I think. You know? Do you think it's a fair representation of old people? No, no, I don't think so. You know, Simon uses a lot of um, artistic license. Norbert Colon is but another nail in the coffin of upright society that we discovered in compiling this documentary, merely adding to a scandal the like of which even I have never before witnessed. But so far, we had not managed to reach the organisation itself. There was only one option, to go back to John Brown and demand. I have to ask them some important questions. Are you sure I can't go and see them? Well, if you want to ask them some questions, why don't you tell me what they are? I'll get their answers and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get That's them That's simply not good enough. I feel the public have a right to know what they have to say. I'm just being practical. They're extremely busy. They've got no time for interviews and I, I see no particular point. If you want to ask them questions, as I say, I'll very happily put them to them and come back to you with the, with the answers they give. Surely they can spend half an hour during their lunch time. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose they could at some stage. Um, I, I could get back to you and see if they can do that for just half an hour. I feel you're being very evasive. Well, as I said, I mean, if you want to go and talk to them for half an hour in lunch break, if you want to go all the way up to uh, Newcastle, fine. I mean, you can't, you literally can't stay for more than half an hour. So, I mean, there would be no question of filming or anything like that. But that why can't we take the life. cameras in? Because it takes too long, because they have to, you know, you have to put up lights and stuff like that. You know, if you want a quick word with them, I mean, you could do it over the phone. That would probably be easiest. But uh, no, there's no question of sort of going up and filming them for the show or indeed bringing them down because it simply takes up too much time. So it'll be OK to go and meet them without cameras? Yes, uh, for no more than half an hour, yes, certainly. Thank you. All right, here I am outside the Viz offices. Now, we want to go inside and talk to Christopher Donald. They won't allow us to film in there, so we've decided to put a concealed camera inside the briefcase here. I'm also wired for sound. My name's Philip Branston. I'm here to see Chris Donald. Just a second. Thank you. Hello, Chris. There's a Philip Branston here to see you. All right, will do. You'd just like to go through the first door on the left. Thanks very much. Branston. Oh, yes, Tom told me about it. How'd you do? Oh, I'm Yes. Um, I suppose you want to meet everyone. This is Graham. This is Simon Donald. Thank you. Simon, thank you. Simon, thank you. How'd you do? Thanks very much. Uh, I wonder, could I ask you a few questions? What sort of questions is it that you uh, are wanting to ask? Because John didn't really say what it was about in, in any great detail. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to ask, why won't you ask, answer our questions on camera? And, um, well, that's, uh, we took John's advice on that. You see, the problem with like, having television crews and that in is that, A, it takes up a lot of time, and, B, they tend to edit things together and make out, uh, paint a grimmer picture than there actually is. They can be a bit misleading television interviews once they've been edited down. We talk to the press, because, I mean, at least, you know, when you talk to them, they'll print what you say. Mm. But, I mean, you can, like, put anybody's voice over our voice and make us say anything. Well, you know, I mean, you could just, like... Well, I'm not saying you will, but, I mean, they, it's possible. They cut in... You know, like, you could take an answer that, that we've given and then you could reword the question. That's rubbish. Um, but, well, anyway, that's, how, well, that's, that's right. why just we want... Just ask any questions you want and we'll answer them and you can, like... I think you've got something to hide. How do you justify ridiculing our royal family? It's our royal family as well. And we're not aliens, you know. It's our royal family just as much as it's yours. And we pay the tax what keeps them in jam scones and stuff. People don't think they've got a sense of humour. I mean, I'm sure they... I mean, know, have you got a complaint from something. the royal family that you're relaying, or is this just all concocted? I'm afraid that royal family are unable to complain due to their high position. Well, I just, like... This is why I think it's very unfair, but the British public are, understandably, miffed. Well, they've got, like, there's loads of people in the royal family have got a press office. They haven't, they've never rang us up and said, could you just take it easy on Fergie? She's having a bit of trouble with her arse this month. We've never, like, had any communication from them. I mean, if they did talk to us, we'd listen, but they just say no, so you presume that they're just quite happy to get on with it. Isn't all that sort of talk obscene? Well, I mean, obscenity is... Well, it's hard to tell. The comic's not obscene because lawyers read it and, like, prove that it's not obscene. It can't be obscene if it goes into the shops, so it's a matter of opinion, I suppose, whether it's offensive or not. You're undermining we're not Pat our we're British all, standards. We're all Pat Can you give us an example? The fat slags, for instance. I don't believe there's people that go around like that, ha making love on street corners for bags of chips. Well, you obviously act in different circles to us, because I've seen people doing it mm -hmm. with bags of chips. This, th now we're getting down to it. <laughs> I, mean, I think just... we've got... To, really, we have got down to it, haven't we? I mean, if you walk around any street corner in, <laughs> in Newcastle, there's well, people... Well, you saw it in Newcastle? With a bag of chips. Did you see it in Newcastle? You would see sort of things a bit like that in Newcastle, probably, on, on a Saturday night, when people have had a few drinks. I've never seen Mount Everest, but I quite believe it's there. How do you answer the accusation that you have destroyed certain personalities' careers, such as Keith Chegwin? Well, well we, we're aware that we've upset Keith, and obviously we, we'd rather it didn't happen. Well, well, I, mean, I think that that's, that's a lot to do with his attitude towards the thing. I mean, if he just laughed it off and brushed it aside, perhaps he, he would have coped a bit better. Well, I think it's just... Long, long, long ago enough in the past. I mean, you're telling he's, he's, still still gro together. he's still groping on about it. I don't know when you've heard him, like, complaining, but he probably made a bit of a fuss when we actually printed a story about him. But, I mean, if he's still sat on his arse complaining about it now, then it's no wonder he's not getting anywhere these days. Mm -hmm. Keith Chegan is a talented TV presenter and I feel that he's been much maligned by this particular comic. Well, there was only one article we did about him. Well, or two. There's two, probably. But I mean, like, I, you know, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who we've done stories about, and they haven't got so bothered about it as he did. How do you sleep in your beds at night? Just let you go to sleep. The covers. Put my head on the pillow. And there's nothing to. There's nothing to. Like, we don't take our problems home with us. We all sleep perfectly well. What sort of swear words do you use in your comic? <clears throat> well, I mean, why? I mean, you, you must know. No, I don't. Well, bottom, toilet. Those aren't swear words. Those direction. aren't British swear words. Well, yeah, all right, so there's others, but I mean... Uh, Which ones? What, you mean like the F word? The F word. You're yeah. a coward. Well, bollocks. We use that one sometimes. And the other ones. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Because, I mean, if you say you can't use those kind of words, then you're, like, closing off part of the English language, aren't you? From, you like, uh, you're England is, a swe uh, is not a swearing country. We don't swear in England. I mean, every, come on, like, it's like everybody swears. Nobody swears in television. Swear words than any other country. Or radio, especially Radio 4. Yeah. I've heard swear words on Radio 4. I don't think so. Only in their proper context. I've heard people say lavatory on Radio 4. That's acceptable. Why is that acceptable? Who makes the standards as, what, as to what's acceptable and what's not, though? 
I mean, toilet roll now is a dirty word because you, you see they're changing it to bathroom tissue. Yeah. I mean, it's like we're ashamed to call toilet roll toilet roll. And in America, you can't even say toilet. You've got you to, say to say bathroom. bathroom. You ask where the bathroom is. Are you you're anti-American. No, we're not. Like, but well, you say, it. an mean, American will say, you where's the bathroom? You show them where the bathroom is, you go back and find a crap in your bath. In Britain, in Britain, people are scared to talk to the doctor about their private parts. Because, like, people have got things wrong with their private parts and they've had things wrong with them for years because they're scared to go into the doctors and say, doctor, there's something wrong with my parts. Which private part do you mean? I'm talking well, about... Well, you're being very ambiguous. I'm talking about people's reproductive organs. Their parts. People are scared to go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I've got a problem with my reproductive organ, my generative member. They won't talk about piles or anything to do with bottoms or anything. You can't go to the people doctor. Are very I mean, people are very scared of going to the doctor and saying, Doctor, I've got bottom grapes, aren't they? I mean, I mean if anything, we've, we've made it a bit easier for people to talk about things like mm -hmm. that. But we never get any credit for it. We just get accused of all sorts of things. I'm sorry I let one go there. <laughs> I don't think it's a laughing matter. <laughs> I do have a colonic problem. <laughs> well, I, you know, you can't help laughing, particularly when a man like yourself dressed in a suit sort of drops a fart in your presence. I mean, like, that's what it's all about, isn't it, really? Well, as you can see, by now I had struck up quite a rapport with the Viz organisation. They came to regard me as one of their own. And with this newfound trust and cooperation, bringing in the cameras became a mere formality. But after the torrent of complaints that I'd so far unearthed, I must say that I found the reality perplexing. These shrewd men appear, at least on the surface, frighteningly normal. They showed me what they regard as their true obsessions. What sort of train is this, Chris? Uh, this is an 08. It's like a little diesel shunter from the 1950s, diesel electric shunter, with an 060 wheel arrangement. It's just, it's not very fast or anything, and it's a bit old and rickety. But it does the job, it gets me to work anyway. It saves a fortune in train fares. Do you still go train spotting, Chris? Um, I don't go out as much as I used to. I used to go out every Saturday. Every Saturday morning, we'd go to Gateshead Sheds and see what was on the shed. And then we'd come over to the central station, and a little group of us would sit at the end of the platform, all about sort of 12 or 13 or 14, and the old 45-year-old man with thick spectacles who'd like linger outside the toilets. But it was, I think it's a fairly healthy hobby. People sort of say train spotting's unhealthy and they can't understand it, but it's just like watching cricket or sitting fishing or playing cricket. I mean, there's not much happens most of the time, but it's just sort of, it's a pleasant way to relax. Um, what sort of engine is this, Simon? Well, this is the 970 unit, which is one of the rarest in existence. Um, 978 of them built in, uh, not in 63, 64, around then, I think. Um, there's only 55 registered left in existence with the Cooper register. So has this car been raced at all? Uh, it's been raced at Goodwood, I've been told it has. Um, I'm waiting for some pictures of it racing. What sort of things did you do at school? Uh, and I'm not really talking about the lessons. Um, well, at junior school, I was, um, I was a nice little boy. And uh, I never misbehaved or anything. And I remember my first day quite vividly, because I didn't know uh, that you were supposed to have shorts for PE. Even, you know, you, we wore these grey flannel shorts, as all kids did in those days. And um, I didn't know that you were supposed to have, like, other shorts to do your, your, your PE lesson in. And uh, all of a sudden they said, it's PE now, everyone get their shorts out. And, uh, and I didn't have any shorts and I started crying. And uh, this other kid said, uh, ah, but you have got shorts. And then the teacher produced this uh, little sort of purple bag with my name uh, sewn onto it, like a, a pump bag, you know. And there was a pair of pumps and a pair of shorts in it. And uh, I didn't even know that, that it existed and my mother had made it and everything. Graham, botany is your first love and we're in your greenhouse. Could you show me perhaps your favourite plant? Mm, well, my favourite plant actually is this one, the umbrella plant, Cypressus alternifolius, that's a nice one. But actually the most interesting plant probably in the greenhouse is this thing here. And it's not actually, it's not actually a plant we've planted, it's a weed. In fact, it's, um, it's a bryophyte, it's called Marcantia polymorpha, and it grows like in lawns, it's also, you know, it, gardeners hate it. But it's dead interesting because it's got two methods of reproducing, like most plants have only got one.
This has actually got two. It's got a normal sexual method, like through spores and things, which is sort of the, the usual thing for bryophytes. But it's also got an asexual method by means of these little things. I don't know whether you can see them. They're called gemmy. They're like little flat plates of cells that sit inside these gemmy cups. And what happens is the rain drops in and splashes them out. And they sort of flick out a certain distance and land on the soil and, and just grow asexually into completely new plants. So it's got sort of two for the price of one. It's a good plant, that. So you're not sorry that you left science, in fact? I'm sorry I left science because I enjoyed it, but I think what I've done is, uh, it's probably a good decision and I enjoy what I'm doing now equally as much, if not slightly more so. You don't think that perhaps you've pissed on your chips as far as the science world is concerned? Mm. Oh, I, I don't think so. Not, uh, not any more than any other career. I mean, I can see the point you're making. Somebody might think, ha, you know, if you work for that bunch, you know, don't think you're working for me. But I don't think uh, there'll be any more of that in science than there would in any other career. I don't think, probably. Simon, can you tell us a little bit about this bus? Well, it's a Daimler CVD6, six-cylinder, and it's got an eight-litre engine, and it was built in 1938, and uh, it seats 35 people. It's got... Um, uh, the Daimler fluid flywheel transmission, and uh, it's uh, it's really rather nice. It was taken off the roads in 1960, and I mean, like Graham and Chris and Simon, all bought houses with their money, but I decided to buy a bus. Do you ever have an urge to stop and pick up passengers? Yeah, but of course I can't because I don't have a PSV license, so I'm not allowed to pick up passengers. I can only sort of drive backwards and forwards. Have you ever been tempted? I have been tempted once or twice, but uh, I've never succumbed. Well, you need sort of, I suppose, five or six parking spaces to get this in. Um, and it's a bit of a, I mean, reversing a bit of a, a swine, and the brakes are very stiff as well. These mild-mannered men appear in stark contrast to the questionable material that they publish, which, with an estimated readership of five million, will almost certainly have penetrated the very highest echelons of our society. A worrying situation indeed, if viz is the enemy within. But as a democratic society, each one of us has a duty to make our voice heard. I would rank viz as the sewer press. A fart is nearly always a good joke, and the grander and richer the person who farts, the funnier it is. I just don't think it has any parallel in this country, and I hope that it won't have any parallel in this country again. Graham? How do you think fame and fortune will change you? Well, uh, as for the fortune, I'm planning to extend the greenhouse. I'm going to get a large tropical heated greenhouse that'll be heated all year round so as I can grow sort of tree ferns and larger tropical palms. Filth. Being a bachelor, as I am, I'm now in a position where if I was to, uh, to meet a young lady, it would be rather sort of... Um, difficult to hide from her the fact that um, I'm a very sort of successful and wealthy man. Obscene filth. I've got a job that I enjoy. I've got a Dame the CVD6 and, you know, really there's not a great deal more I could ask for. Vile, obscene filth. I don't think fame really comes into it because I've always said that nobody knows who the editor of the Beano is and I'm sure the editor of the Beano doesn't get, like, interrupted when he's having a meal in restaurants and stuff, and when I take this false nose and false eyelashes off, no one will recognise me when I go home tonight. Um, fame's not really a, a problem, but as far as fortune goes, somebody asked me the other day, do you not feel guilty making so much money? And I thought, no. They just don't know how much it hurts. I mean, not just, you know, personally, and career-wise. I mean, to be honest, I'd love to walk into the office with a copy of this and shove it down their throat. Great, thanks. And that brings us to the end of the Viz documentary. Image upon image. Words without meaning. Where does stillness end? And motion begin. These are some of the questions we hope we've answered. This is Philip Branston for Channel 4 on the toilet.
a load of old bollocks that was, Tom. That sort of shite's killing TV. I'd have thought it had been right up your street, Roger. Oh, piss off. I'm an entertainer, Tom. Talking of which, I've got a great idea for a game show. It's called Celebrity Knockers. Now, we'll get a board with two holes in. God. Now, you bring your celebrities round the back, and then you have three guests round the front. One by one, they feel the knockers. What do you think?